evil actually proves God's existence because in the absence of God, good and evil as such would not exist. Dr. Stenger's third argument was that naturalistic explanations are preferable to supernaturalistic explanations. Well, it may surprise him to hear me say that I entirely agree with that. Whenever you have two explanations that are available, a naturalistic one or a supernaturalistic one, I would say as a methodological principle, you go first with the naturalistic explanation. And it's only when the good naturalistic explanation is not available that one would be justified in preferring a supernaturalistic explanation. But Dr. Stinger's real complaint is that a supernaturalistic explanation is no explanation at all. He says just to say God did it doesn't explain anything. But you notice that wasn't the structure of my arguments. My arguments, many of them, were deductive. That is to say, if the premises are true, then the conclusion follows logically and inescapably, whether you like it or not, whether you think it's explanatory or not. For example, everything that comes into being has a cause. The universe came into being, therefore the universe has a cause. And then you do an analysis of what is to be a cause of the universe. Or, if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. But objective values do exist, therefore it follows logically and inescapably that God exists. So when you're dealing with deductive arguments, it really doesn't matter whether you like the explanation or not. As long as the premises are true, the conclusion is logically inescapable. As for the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, this was a hypothesis that forms the basis of an inference to the best explanation in terms of the standard historical criteria used for uh, historical justification, such as explanatory power, explanatory scope, plausibility, and so forth. And I think in every one of the cases that I enunciated this evening, we do have good grounds for inferring what we could call a supernatural explanation. Finally, number four, he says that God's action should be observable in the world. And what I would respond to that is that there is abundant evidence of God's actions in the world. Uh, in fact, what I would say is that the very existence of the universe itself is abundant evidence for the existence of God, as I explained. If God exists, what greater evidence should we expect of his being than the origin of the universe out of absolutely nothing at some point in the finite past? The fine-tuning of the universe to an incomprehensible precision for the existence of intelligent life. The existence of an objective realm of moral values. The resurrection and radical claims of Jesus of Nazareth and the interpersonal experience of God himself. Dr. Stenger, to carry his argument, would have to show that if God existed, we ought to have more evidence than that. And it seems to me that that's just pure speculation, pure presumption. So I think we have quite good evidence for God's existence, and therefore none of his four arguments are sound. Now, what about the reasons that I gave? I'd like to uh, advance these a little bit further. First, the argument from existence. Here, the, the question is the very existence of the universe. Even if you say the universe is eternal, the question is why does an eternal universe exist rather than nothing? You have to have a necessary transcendent being that is the sufficient reason for why anything exists rather than nothing. What about the argument from the beginning of the universe? What brought the universe into being? Well, in his book, Dr. Stenger proposes that the initial instant of time, t equals zero, is not only the beginning of our time, but it is also the beginning of a backward growing time as well as in figure one. And he takes this to be equivalent to an eternally existing universe with no beginning. Unfortunately, Dr. Stinger's scenario is self-contradictory and incoherent. For on his theory, t equals negative one is supposed to be after t equals zero. But by drawing negative time on the same axis as positive time, t equals negative 1 also turns out to be before t equals 0, which is self-contradictory. Since t equals 0 is supposed to be the beginning of both time dimensions, in order to avoid contradiction, Dr. Stinger should have drawn the two time axes perpendicular to each other, as in uh, figure 2. But then it's obvious that on his model, uh, it doesn't avoid the absolute beginning of the universe. Both dimensions of time have an absolute origin at t equals zero, and therefore I think the model doesn't avoid the question of what brought the universe into being. 
What about the argument from fine tuning? In his book, Dr. Stinger invite, uh, indicts the fine tuning argument by saying, well, some other form of life might have evolved had the fine tuning not existed. Uh, perhaps life based on silicon instead of carbon. And what I want to say here is that if we're to avoid talking nonsense here, we need to define what we mean clearly by life. By life, scientists mean that property of organisms to take in food, extract energy from it, adapt, grow, and reproduce. And the point is that in order to permit life, the constants and quantities have to be so finely tuned that it is incomprehensible. Scientists who study this are fully aware of alternative proposed bases for life, and the problem is they don't work. For example, take silicon. Silicon is hopelessly inadequate as a basis for life for a number of reasons. It is no coincidence that there is no living thing made out of silicon. Nothing made out of silicon is alive. Dr. Stenger is reduced to saying in his article on fine tuning, computer chips are made of silicon. And the network of computer chips known as the World Wide Web seems to have taken on a life of its own. Well, come on now. Uh, when biologists talk about life, they don't mean it in this metaphorical sense. They're talking about life in the sense that I defined it. And the point is that that kind of life could not exist based on silicon. Even more importantly, silicon itself wouldn't even exist without the fine tuning of the universe. Without the fine tuning of the universe, in many cases, there wouldn't even be chemistry. There wouldn't even be the heavy elements. So that the fine tuning of the universe, I think, is simply a scientific fact. And the question is, how do you best explain it? Well, neither physical necessity nor chance can explain it. And I think that suggests that design is the best uh, alternative. The other arguments I, I don't have time to reinforce in this speech, but I'll uh, wait to hear Dr. Stenger's refutation of those in his rebuttal uh, and then comment perhaps during the dialogue time on what he has to say. Dr. Stenger now has 12 minutes for his rebuttal. Okay, thank you. Could you put my uh, slides up? Good. Well, I'm going to respond uh, now mainly to uh, Dr. Craig's opening remarks. However, I will add, try to add some further comments on what he's just said. Now, Carl Sagan has said that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And he probably wasn't the first one to say that. Well, Dr. Craig has made what I regard as the extraordinary claim that certain empirical facts require a supernatural explanation. Now, in order to refute that, all I need to do is provide plausible natural explanations for these phenomena. I need not prove these. If he wants to argue that God is required to exist in order to explain the observed universe, Dr. Craig must disprove all possible natural explanations for these phenomena. Let's start with his cosmological argument. Dr. Craig argues that whatever begins must have a cause. The universe had a beginning. Therefore, the universe must have had a cause. However, we know from physics that not everything that begins has a cause. Physical bodies begin to exist all the time without cause. That's considered radioactive decay of an atomic nucleus. Uh, the alpha particle or beta particle or gamma particle that are, uh, that are emitted in a radioactive decay, uh, those particles come into being, come into existence without a cause. The beginning of the Big Bang, the universe was like a subatomic particle. So these ideas could apply. Again, I can't prove it, but I don't have to prove it. That here is one example that, that refutes Dr. Craig's claim that everything begins must have a cause. But even if everything that begins has a cause, it does not apply, uh, this does not necessarily apply to the universe if the universe did not have a beginning. Dr. Craig argues that the Big Bang is evidence that the universe had a beginning. 
However, the universe need not have begun with the Big Bang. And I'm not talking about m this one particular speculation from my book. There are many uh, prominent physicists and cosmologists who publish papers in reputable scientific journals proposing various scenarios by which the Big Bang appeared naturally out of a pre-existing universe that need not of itself have had a beginning. One such recent example is the cyclic universe. Now Dr. Craig also claims that the universe had to begin because if it were in, 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 infinitely old, it would take an in, infinite time to reach the present. However, if the universe is infinitely old, then it had no beginning, not a beginning infinitely long ago.